Please welcome back Suzanne P. Clark, President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm trying to decide if I should say good morning or good afternoon. I've lost track of the time, I think. But hello. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. It is a historic day for the United States and for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. As you know, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of U.S.-Kenya diplomatic relations and marking the first state visit by an African president since 2008. I think we can all agree that 16 years is far too long, but we are hopeful that President Ruto's time in Washington will usher in a new era of regular state visits by African leaders. On top of that, today we've brought together senior government officials, business leaders, and industry partners as we observe World Trade Month and on the eve of Africa Day. What better time could there be to illustrate the importance of partnership between the United States and Kenya? What better platform to elevate the trade and investment ties between our nations and demonstrate the bright future for the U.S.-Kenya strategic relationship? To underscore that, I want to very quickly focus on three ideas we heard in the video. Collaboration, opportunity, and innovation. I'll begin with collaboration, which we see in full force here today, and it's long been a priority of the U.S. Chamber's work in Kenya. The Chamber brings partners together to advance commercial cooperation between our nations, from heads of state to private sector leaders, like our close friends at the AmCham Kenya. We give a voice through the U.S. Africa Business Center, which has advocated for stronger economic ties between U.S. and Africa since 2009. We provide a platform for the American business community to work directly with Kenyan leaders, from convening a presidential executive roundtable at the UN General Assembly shortly after President Ruto took office, to the 2023 U.S.-Kenya Bilateral Strategic Dialogue. And we travel the globe, leading trade missions to Nairobi for the AmCham Business Summit, as well as the Kenya International Investment Conference to convene a dialogue on the AFC-FTA Digital Protocol along with numerous delegations of private sector executives, including last month, to coincide with Secretary Raimondo's successful and important visit to Kenya. Our goal through all of this collaboration is to deepen American business ties with Kenya. And the why behind that, as you all well know, is opportunity. East Africa, led by Kenya, continues to be one of the engines of growth on the continent and in the global economy. Kenya is home to one of Africa's most diversified and fastest growing economies. And with a young entrepreneurial population and talented workforce, it's increasingly a vibrant hub of economic activity. In Kenya, we see a country of limitless private sector potential if we are willing to seize it. And the U.S. Chamber is working to make that happen. 24 years ago this week, the Chamber helped lead the charge for congressional passage of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which has been an important cornerstone of the economic partnership. Like many champions in this room today, including, including Senator Chris Coons, who recently introduced a bill in the Senate to this effect, we support a GOA reauthorization. And in 2020, right here in this great hall, the Kenyan government announced its intention to negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States. We immediately launched a U.S.-Kenya trade working group to exchange ideas and seek common ground on trade priorities. And we continue to support the ambition of a robust trade and investment agreement. As we heard just moments ago from President Ruto, Kenya deeply understands that their future is tied to how they trade with countries around the world. And at the Chamber, we know that when the U.S. trades and invests with other countries, we're not only supporting jobs and creating opportunities here in the United States, we're deepening important strategic partnerships and advancing free enterprise around the world. Finally, I just want to touch quickly on innovation because it is innovation that will shape our future and how the U.S. and Kenya will tackle shared challenges. Kenya is, of course, known from its, for its silicon savanna. 
It's a reflection of the country's role as a hub for innovation and of the role U.S. companies like Google and IBM and Microsoft and others have played and will play in the business ecosystem there. To foster even greater innovation, innovation, the U.S. Chamber is pleased to announce here today a green tech business mission to Kenya, which we look forward to organizing in partnership with the U.S. government. We want to showcase the promise of U.S. green technology and provide a platform for real discussion about projects, innovative solutions, and regulatory best practices. So innovation is also the topic of our next discussion. And we are fortunate to hear more about the power of public-private partnerships from three of the top decision makers on U.S.-Kenya policy. Leading our discussion is a former CEO putting decades of private sector experience to work for business as our envoy in Nairobi, U.S. Ambassador to Kenya, Meg Whitman. And our two featured guests are leaders who have both worked hard to support the tech ecosystem in Africa. Vice President Kamala Harris has spearheaded public-private partnerships at home and abroad. She traveled to Africa last year for a three-country tour, putting a spotlight on opportunities to invest in African innovation and galvanizing new initiatives to promote digital inclusion on the continent. And joining her, of course, is our very special guest of honor, President William Ruto of Kenya, a successful businessman in his own right, who made digital transformation a signature initiative of his administration. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving President Ruto, Vice President Harris, and Ambassador Whitman a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, almost good afternoon, and thank you both for joining us. It's really a privilege for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, I think our audience. So, um, Madam Vice President, um, I'll start with you, if you don't mind. So, um, you have been a leader on Africa policy in the Biden-Harris administration, and you visited, um, you know, uh, Suzanne mentioned Ghana, Tanzania, and Zambia last year. We missed you in Kenya. <laughs> I'll get there, I promise. I will get there. And you focus specifically on investing in innovation and investing in young people and investing in women. Yes. So, why did you take that approach, and what are your lasting impressions from the trip? What did you learn that was particularly interesting? Well, thank you, Madam Ambassador. And Mr. President, it is good to be with you on this stage. I strongly believe that we are at a moment where we should revisit and upgrade and update um, the narrative of the relationship between the United States and the continent of Africa. When you think about the continent, the median age is 19 years old, 19. It is predicted that by 2050, one in four people occupying space on Mother Earth <laughs> will be on the continent of Africa. So when I think of it just from that perspective, many could rightly argue that the future is on the continent of Africa. Uh, yes. I also think, and I'll speak very candidly here, that we have to revisit and, and, and revise the narrative around the relationship in a way that appreciates that ours, the role of the United States, should not be one of, of, of benevolence, but of thinking about the relationship in the context of partnership. Mm -hmm. So it is not about, and simply about aid, but about investment. And understanding the capacity that exists and has been proven to be strong on the continent, and therefore is worthwhile in terms of an investment, understanding it will yield a great return on investment. And when I think, Mr. President, in particular about your leadership in Kenya, I think this is empirical evidence of the need, of the imperative of the United States through our government and private sector partnering 
with Kenyans, with the Kenyan government, in a way that recognizes the extraordinary opportunity for continued investment writ large in innovation. Thinking about what we must do as a global community around addressing crises like the climate crisis. What we can do through those investments that makes clear and real what we know to be the growth that broad-based economic growth that occurs wherever and everywhere when you invest in women. And then doing that work through a partnership that um, also appreciates it is good for American business to be invested in relationships that contribute to global stability. Global stability, of course, results also in global economic stability. And so for all of these reasons, I simply believe it is the right thing to do, not to mention the intertwined history between the continent and our country, but also if we are going to be at all forward thinking, it is an imperative. Frankly, as vice president, I say this as a devout public servant. Um, sadly, often our strategy around foreign policy is based on the crisis of the moment. And part of how I think about the future and the imperative of the relationship with African nations is based on a vision that public policy be formed and implemented now based on a vision for the next 10, 20, and 50 years. And again, that all brings me back to the continent of Africa and Kenya as an example of a vibrant partnership. Great, thank you very much. I, I, the doing things before you have a crisis yes. is a lot easier How about that? than waiting until afterwards. Yes. Um, Mr. President, you have been a tremendous champion for tech and uh, innovation in Kenya and uh, its ability to spur economic development and promote opportunity. So, and also, by the way, uh, advancing gender equality and inclusion. So just love to hear your point of view, maybe your evolving point of view on the power of technology and what it can do for Kenya. And for those of you who don't know, um, Kenya was the, des the largest destination for startup capital on the continent in 2023, ahead of Nigeria, ahead of South Africa, and ahead of Egypt, which is a quite a remarkable <laughs> achievement. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, for finding time to engage with us in this uh, very important American Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, Kenya uh, meeting. Speaking about technology and speaking about opportunities in the technology space, three things come to my mind. Technology is the facility, is, is the instrument that we can use to leapfrog Africa from where we are to the next, to catch up, if I may, with the rest of the world. We have the youngest population. That young population is tech hungry. Yeah. That young population, we have the opportunity to shape it in the direction in which we think it should. And that is why a country like Kenya, we are investing 30% of our budget in education, training, knowledge, skills. We are investing $5 billion every, every year. And I said earlier, it, it's money we believe is an investment because if there is a single most important asset that we have is our human capital. And as my sister Kamala said, we are looking at the continent that will have a quarter of the world's population by 2050, 40% of the world's workforce will be from the African continent. Therefore, it is not only about labor, and therefore you need the correct quality of labor, it is also about market. Yeah. The biggest market ever will exist in the African continent. And therefore, technology is the biggest enabler, the biggest um, multiplier of what can be done. And I, and I see it every day. For example, M-Pesa <laughs> took Kenya from 
uh, a, a banking ratio of, uh, I think, about 20% and tripled it, mm -hmm. you know, just using technology. Mm -hmm. Many more Kenyans, including my mother who has not been to school, she operates in Pesa. Yeah. <laughs> she knows how to do it, right. you know. Right. So that's what happens to many people in Kenya. So we look at technology <clears throat> as an enabler and as a mechanism through which we can use the biggest resource we have in, in our young people, and we can also use it to um, better deliver agriculture, health, education, uh, tax collection, government services. In fact, for Kenya, we are moving all government services. When I came into office, we had 300 government services we're now, we've now moved 17,000 government services on the digital platform because that is where the future is. That's how we can be able to efficiently deliver government services, cost-effectively deliver government services, accountably deliver government services. So accountability, efficiency, um, uh, efficacy, the technology enables us to do all that much more efficiently. Therefore, Madam Kamala Harris, you're focused in the right direction on technology, digital space, young people, women. I think that that space is the space that will give us the greatest output as we go into the future. And it is, for example, the reason just before you came in, we have signed in to a billion dollar investment using American technology from Microsoft, capabilities from G42, capital uh, resources from G42, and renewable energy from Kenya, because Kenya has the extra uh, uh, asset of having tech safi human capital. G22, G42 will tell you, and Microsoft, and I'm sure they are in this meeting. Microsoft will tell you That's some of their best human capital come from Kenya. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Madam Vice President, you might be interested to know that um, Kenya is the home to the only semiconductor technology on the continent, and 70% of their engineers are women. Oh. So, pretty remarkable. Fantastic. So I know how hard you've been working on the digital inclusion project, and I think today you're, you're going to talk a little bit about the progress that yes. you've made and, um, and you know, building on the trip that you made to Africa. So maybe you can bring us up to speed on what you've accomplished and, and um, how you're sure. feeling about the whole program. I will, but first I just must thank you, Meg Whitman, for taking up the position of being ambassador. Um, I've known the ambassador for a long time, I say with a bit of bravado as a proud Californian, and, um, and your work and your groundbreaking work um, in technology is extraordinary, and this is just the perfect moment that you would step up and serve in this capacity, and I thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. So uh, digital inclusion is, was at the heart of the idea for this initiative that is focused on the continent. And I want to thank a few people who I know are here. Brad Smith is here. Michael Meebach is here. Um, it, it, was, it was companies like Microsoft, MasterCard, foundations. Um, Melinda French Gates was one of the earliest to contribute as much as $10 million for the women in digital inclusion focused on women, um, the Ford Foundation. And so essentially, this is how it all happened, is a simplified version. I got on the phone and I called a bunch of people. And I um, and called them to say, I, I know that you have some interest based on the work that you've done before. Can we collaborate in a focused way that develops synergy around a public-private partnership? And the foundation for the work being digital inclusion, understanding that all business at this point is tech business. And any business, any economy that is going to grow, um, much less be sustainable mm. between now and the future, must um, integrate and adapt and adopt technology. 
uh, in, a, in, a, in a very, um, in an institutional way. And this includes, as you described, Mr. President, your mother. It includes that it must be the people, not just the governments and the, and the corporations, that understand how the technology works. Another piece of the focus was something I've long believed, many of us do. If, you, if we are focused on strengthening economies, one of the smartest ways to do that is to invest in women. The reality is that when you improve the economic condition, when you improve the economic condition of women, you improve the economic condition of families, communities, and all of society benefits. So a lot of the, the work then, in terms of the initial design, was to think of it that way. It was also to layer upon um, the initiative, what are the, 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 the current crises that we must address in a way that we see opportunity for economic growth, mm -hmm. the climate crisis being an obvious one the climate crisis having a direct impact on agricultural economies. And knowing then that we are developing the, the, the most extraordinary smart technology to help farmers. Mm -hmm. And when they have access to technology, when they are able to get online, the services that are available will help them with crop management, will help them determine what crop they should plant this season based on satellite technology which can predict the weather for that period of time so they are not bound by tradition. Uh, technology which helps farmers determine whether there is too much water in drought conditions that are being used on a specific plant, too much fertilizer which we know has an impact on the climate. All of this is facilitated, these traditions, these traditional ways of either growing or not growing economies can be facilitated, like you said, Mr. President, when we look at the issue of digital inclusion. So we developed this partnership that is a public-private partnership. I know that Michael and Brad talked earlier about what we are doing specifically, but the, the vision is that we can, and U.S. businesses in particular, can partner with our allies in a way that invests in the infrastructure that allows these economies to thrive. I will also say I'm a big believer in public partnership, public-private partnerships for two main reasons. One, we as government, we have the, the, the scale. We have the ability to scale. But truly, the private sector has the depth of skill and expertise often that when you combine it with the scale capacity of government, can have a profound impact on large populations of people. The second point I will make, especially as vice president, is that through these public-private partnerships, I can speak then with our allies or potential partners around the globe. I'm doing this work, for example, in the northern part of Central America. And I can then sit down with world leaders and explain to them that private investment, US investment, will be dependent and reliant on in, in rule of law, on democracy, on an adherence and respect for human rights. And understand then in that way the power of public-private partnerships, especially when we are talking about these relationships around the globe. Understanding that increasingly US business is interdependent and interdependent with our allies and nations around the world. And these partnerships then make a lot of sense. Um, let, me, that's, let me follow that up quickly, and we have just a few more minutes. But um, Mr. President, tell us a little bit about how you think about these partnerships um, and how you think about Americans, since we're here in America, how you think about the American companies and, uh, and how they're helping you to skill to build out this ecosystem. Vice President Kamala Harris has said a very profound thing about relationships, building the correct relationship. We need to recalibrate, you know, our, our engagement. Let, let me start with where we were at the Africa Climate Summit last year. Mm -hmm. At the Africa Climate li Summit last year, we pushed to change the narrative around Africa. For a long time, it was about blame game, who caused this, why, why this has happened. We decided we cannot continue to be in the victim corner. 
let's get ourselves and project a new narrative. Kenya, uh, Kenya and Africa can be part of the solution. You know? And, and for a moment, it, it looked strange because people were wondering, we thought we were victims of climate change. We, we thought we didn't cause it. Africa costs only 4%. Why, how can we be part of the solution? We're saying we have the largest resources of renewable energy. Mm -hmm. We have the youngest population. We have 60% of the world's arable land which we can use smart agriculture. We have the natural carbon sinks. We have the largest minerals that are even necessary for energy transition. Why is a rich continent in a corner looking weak and defeated and, and a victim? So we, we decided to change the narrative. And for the first time, we had a different conversation. Mm -hmm. We are discussing, since we have tremendous con uh, potential, how do we move this to opportunity and to investment? Yeah. That is the conversation. So th that's point number one. And we must have it both ways. We have some work to do on our side. Our partners, like the US, have some work to do. Aid will not get us anywhere. Extracting raw materials from Africa will not get us anywhere. So it's, it's balanced. We, we must stop the extraction, but we must also think outside aid. And the place to think is about investment. Mm -hmm. And when you are thinking investment, you must think about how to bring both public and private investment. And that is why private public engagement yeah. is ultimate. That's right. It is necessary. I'll give you examples. We have the most modern uh, expressway in Nairobi. It wasn't built using government money. Mm -hmm. It was built using private sector money in a PPP framework. Mm -hmm. it, it's working. I am now doing a PPP framework to, deli to transmit for energy transmission. We're doing the first five transmission lines in Kenya. Why should government invest money in a transmission line when we can only pay a willing charge for somebody in the private sector who can invest their money? We are looking at how we can also do it with the airport, how we can do it with the ports, how we can do it with the rest. So that way, we can bring huge investment money into our economies without necessarily at contracting debt yeah. or looking for aid. Let me give a perfect example today here. We just signed an investment of a billion dollars. You know, it would take me ages <laughs> to get a billion dollars from any government, including the American government. It would but, take us that long, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would take me ages. But the private sector can do it. They, they will bring the billion dollars right. because it makes business sense to them. That's right. You know, they, they are investing, they will make money, we will use our geothermal, we will employ our, our young people, they will pay taxes, everybody will win, they will make profits, so it is win-win. So we must also, as, as, as government, as Africa, we must make ourselves investment ready. So that by eliminating barriers, eliminating roadblocks, making it easy for those who want to invest in our corner to do so. And that is why, one more thing, that is why we are having an engagement to make sure that Africa is not unfairly profiled as a risky continent yeah. and thereby making investors, <laughs> you know? And, and, and it is the reason why I was having a very robust en engagement with President Biden, and I must thank him profusely because he agreed with me that we need a reform of the international financial architecture so that we make it fairer, so that all countries, all continents can access finances without unnecessary profiling and without uh, making them pay more than they should. So. Believe you me, 
I think we are having the right conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we are, we are having the right conversation. And conversation around having a, a, a level playing field so that both public and especially the private sector can do what they do best and government can facilitate and do what we can do best. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It is my responsibility. It's my responsibility to get Madam Vice President to her lunch that she is hosting. But I want to commend your leadership on this subject. Thank you for what you do for Africa. And if you want to just say one last word, we really, really, a round of applause for the Vice President. She's done a remarkable, remarkable job. Thank you. I will emphasize the point that President Ruto made. The, the, the capacity that we have in public-private partnership is being illustrated around our focus on the continent of Africa. And let it be an example. As we think about future forward policy, that is where the future is. We in government don't have not only necessarily the depth of the skill, but we cannot pull together the billions of dollars, to your point, Absolutely. that we can do with these kinds of partnerships that will have exponential and immediate impact. And I'll just close with this. President Ruto, I think that your trip and your visit, this state visit, is history will show an inflection point in how we are revising and upgrading the narrative of the relationship between the United States and the continent of Africa. And I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much.